Democrats are very clear about who they think is responsible. Republicans are less certain. Today, we spoke with Democrat Kathy Manning and Republican Ted Budd. Do you think the president is responsible for urging those protesters to take the action that they did? You know, I didn't hear much of the speech and uh, it was a very busy day, um, but I wish there had been a turning down of the temperature. Do you think that the president could have been or should have been the one to turn down that, that heat? I think if he knew what was going on and what had have happened, um, I think uh, he may have dialed it back a bit. I can't read into his mind. Do you believe that the president is responsible directly for what happened at the Capitol? I do. I think the president has been inciting his supporters with lies and allegations of election fraud that have not been proven. He's been doing it for weeks. He whipped up the mob yesterday morning and instructed them to go to the Capitol. I think the responsibility responsibility lays squarely at his feet. Congressman, as someone who supported the president's claims of a stolen election, do you feel that uh, you're responsible in any way for what happened yesterday? You know, this was not about overturning an election. This was um, a, a right that we had to express millions of Americans who were concerned about particularly six particular states. Uh, that had very questionable results. And we wanted to air those grievances. We wanted to debate them. Do you believe any of the members who have supported those claims share any of that responsibility? I believe that it's the responsibility of leaders to pay attention to the facts and to refrain from putting their own political ambitions ahead of the good of the country. Manning says she supports efforts to replace the president by invoking the 25th Amendment. I don't think we can wait. Bud says he opposes the idea. Um, if they want to score political points, then that's up to them. Um, but the process that's worked for hundreds of years will work in 13 days. Do you accept Joe Biden as the uh, president-elect of the United States? I do. He'll be the next president on uh, January 20th. And it's time for, the, for people to move on and decide that just because their candidate might not have won, we are going to have a peaceful transition of power and we need to come together. Congressman Ted Budd says that some of the protesters who stormed the Capitol may have been members of Antifa dressed up as Trump supporters. He says he spotted one protester with a hammer and sickle tattoo. In Greensboro, I'm Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News. Thank you, Bill. A number of people are pointing out the stark contrast between the police we presence good? that Black Lives Matter protesters encountered last summer and how law enforcement treated the rioters yesterday at the Capitol. Our Leanne Denier is live tonight after speaking with a local advocate for civil rights and racial justice. Leanne. Well, after watching what unfolded in D.C., a lot of people are asking how and why, as well as drawing comparisons to what they saw last summer as people called for racial justice. State University says what happened in our country's capital is a teachable moment in how not to act and not to behave. Says he's angry with the response from law enforcement. They just chose not to show force. And if that was myself and my students or myself and my other colleagues in activism, the response would have been dramatically different. And, and that's the sad reality of this country's history when it comes down to protesting. He says he's saddened people were hurt, but also knows that race played a role in what transpired. And by the lack of leadership he saw not only yesterday, but over the last four years. It's a historical manifestation of the rhetoric and the misinformation and and you know when you you know when you shake a bottle a soda bottle that is and you open a cap we all know what happens manel says it's up to leaders from the city and county level all the way up to the federal government to reassure the public that we can move forward from this so manel says that those feelings of sadness and of anger he is feeling today are real but still he said that he remains optimistic in the future. In Winston-Salem, Leon Denier, WXII 12 News.
Leanne, thank you. Various White House officials have submitted their resignations after yesterday's siege. Deputy Press Secretary Sarah Matthews, Melania Trump's Chief of Staff Stephanie Grisham, and Deputy National Security Advisor Matthew Pottinger all resigned immediately on Wednesday. They were followed by Transportation Secretary Elaine Chao, who said this morning she, quote, cannot set aside the pro-Trump insurrection at the Capitol. By the way, she is married to Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell. Mick Mulvaney, former White House Chief of Staff and current Special Envoy to Northern Ireland, also quit. Protesters swarmed state houses all across the U.S. yesterday as well. About 60 or so people rallied in support of the president outside our state capitol in Raleigh. A group formed in opposition on the other side of the street, and the crowd started shouting back and forth at one another throughout the afternoon. That's about as far as things went there. And coming up, the snow's not quite on the ground yet here in, Ma in Mount Airy, but everyone in the foothills is preparing for a storm to come. Plus, getting your stimulus money after mistakes at the IRS. Jeff Rawson will share the action that you can take right now to get the money that you deserve. Back now with breaking news. We've learned a North Carolina State Highway Patrol trooper has died after a long battle with COVID-19. First Sergeant Timothy Lee Howell passed away just before 3 o'clock this afternoon in Chapel Hill. He is one of more than 7,200 people in North Carolina alone to have died from this highly contagious virus. He is survived by a girlfriend and two daughters. Details related to a celebration of life ceremony are set to be released in the days to come. 
Well, today more than 10,000 new cases of COVID-19 were reported in our state. First time ever we've hit that mark. This comes less than 24 hours after the governor extended the state's curfew for another three weeks. We shattered the daily case record today. 10,389 people to be exact learned since yesterday that they tested positive. It marks our first time we have been in five digit territory in one single day in the state of North Carolina. Hospitalizations have set another new record, a phrase I say almost every night. 3,960 people are now fighting the virus in hospitals all across North Carolina. Local infectious disease expert Dr. Christopher Ohl said today while hospitals are busy, people are still able to get what they need. The Forsyth County Department of Public Health is closing its vaccination appointment line because the department has reached its limit on the number of vaccine appointments that it can physically take right now. Staff does have a call log and will be returning calls to people who weren't able to get through. We are told there are about 2,500 appointments to fill. Registration will reopen once there are more doses available. The state and local areas do get reshipments every single week. Cone Health is doubling its morgue capacity right now. The hospital now has a refrigerator truck because there have been a couple of days recently when the county morgue hit its capacity. Officials tell us not all of these deaths are COVID-19 related, but that the extra deaths are putting a strain on the morgue like the rest of the overall medical system. The trailer has not been used yet. Projections show they could, however, need it. Added storage was also brought in for Alamance Regional in the form of a cooler as well. Our modified stay at home order, as I mentioned, will last for at least another three weeks. It requires people to stay at home between 10 o'clock at night and five in the morning, except for work purposes to take care of loved ones, get groceries, gas or health care reasons. A new secretarial directive from DHHS Secretary Dr. Mandy Cohen urges people not to go to places where folks are not wearing masks and not to go inside anyone else's home or have anybody over if they do not live in your home. To find a testing site near you, there's information on how to schedule a vaccine appointment as well. Or if you'd like to look at the upgraded county alert system, the color coded system, just head to our website, WXII12.com. We have up to the minute information on our live blog there. Well, with winter weather on its way, a lot of people are getting ready, including local school districts who are moving things online in big, big numbers. WXI 12's Ford Hatchet joins us live in Mount Airy to see how the folks up there are gearing up for what will likely be our first flakes of 2021. Ford. Yeah, that's right. And the Surrey County Emergency Services Department tells us they expect as many as eight inches to fall here overnight, potentially impacting roads like Highway 601 behind me. But everyone hard at work preparing for the storm. We've seen brine trucks on the road. And John Shelton, the County Emergency Services Director, says they've been in contact with both police and fire departments and even the National Guard trying to get ready for the storm. And obviously the first snow of the year is always an exciting time for everybody, but especially for school kids hoping for a nice day off. Now with the growth of remote learning, some students feared that the traditional snow day may be a thing of the past. But I spoke with Mount Airy City Schools Superintendent Dr. Kim Morrison today, who said tomorrow will be a snow day for their students. And even though there won't be classes, she says the day still serves as an educational experience. Here in Mount Airy City Schools, we believe students should have fun and learn while they're having fun. You can learn a lot of stuff on a snow day, like the physics of how quickly the sled goes down the hill, how, how, how long it takes you to knock your little brother over so they roll down the hill with you. Uh, all of those things that we got to do as children, we think they should be able to do too. And the Mount Airy City School District has been one of the few that has engaged in face-to-face -face learning for the entire fall since August. And Dr. Morrison says that the day off is a reward for the students who have made that happen with their hard work during the pandemic. From Mount Airy, I'm Ford Hatchet, WXII 12 News. Thank you, Ford. Want to go to Washington next? White House Press Secretary Kaylee McEnany is holding a briefing at the White House one day after the chaos at the Capitol. Let's listen in. And we hold them in our prayers and close to our hearts at this time. We thank our valiant law enforcement officers who are true American heroes. What we saw yesterday was a group of violent rioters undermining the legitimate First Amendment rights of the many thousands who came to peacefully have their voices heard in our nation's capital. Those who violently besieged our capital are the opposite of everything this administration stands for. The core value of our administration is the idea that all citizens have the right to live in safety, peace, and freedom. Those who are working in this building are working to ensure an orderly transition of power. 
Now it is time for America to unite, to come together, to reject the violence that we have seen. We are one American people under God. Thank you very much. All right, well, that didn't last very long. Kaylee McEnany reading a prepared statement, not taking any questions, calling for unity, and promising an orderly transfer of power on January 20th. We'll go to Chief Meteorologist Lenny Pope in just a minute, and in just a minute has apparently arrived. Hey, we've got people working from home. We're still working out some technical bugs. I'm told we have Laney, and I'm told we're going to talk about some snow. It is nice to see you. A lot of people will be happy to see flakes flying in just a few hours. Well, maybe not. All right, we'll get back to Laney in just a little bit. She looked happy. She looked ready to talk about snow. We'll unplug something, turn it off, turn it on again, and get it working in just a little bit. All right, as we head to break, a couple of big jackpots are still up for grabs right now. How much cash is on the line if you like your odds in the lottery? Plus, answering a plea for help to save a man's life, who they say the woman who stepped up is coming up at just the right time. We're back in just a moment. This is WXII 12 News at 5 o'clock. All right, last time we saw Lanny Pope, she had a big smile on her face, all ready to talk about the snow. Unfortunately, her face was stuck that way. Uh, we fixed some technical glitches, and she joins us live now, working from home for the all-important snow forecast. Lanny, good to see you. Well, at least it sounds like I, my face was stuck in a favorable position, right? Well, you know what? A lot of folks get excited about that first snow, right, in the triad, and especially in areas that don't usually see a snow scenario. And I actually think uh, everybody's going to see at least a few snowflakes as we head into tomorrow. And as a result, we do have that winter storm warning up across our area. You're looking out there right now at Stewart, one of the communities that will likely see measurable 
snow across our area. And yes, it does look like that snow, as I mentioned, is going to be in a lot of places. That's why we have a winter storm warning across our area. We don't often get a winter storm warning, and that is uh, telling us that we're going to be expecting some wintry weather across much of our area that will likely impact you. How is it going to impact you? Definitely, I think, with some travel issues, also potentially with some power outages. Morning and evening commute is what we're talking about for tomorrow, and then even continuing into Saturday morning because any of that heavy wet snow that does manage to pile up on the roadways is going to be slick. Here's the timeline with this. The rain and the snow begins tonight. A heavy wet snow for most folks during the day tomorrow. There'll be a little bit of rain mixed in, especially the farther south and east you are. Tomorrow night that snow starts to wind down and move away into places like Raleigh. It probably won't make it to the coast as they will likely have rain. I am anticipating a mainly snow event in this area here, but I do think there's going to be some rain mixing in and it's not going to be a uniform all snow area. It doesn't look like across our region. So if you start to see kind of that sloppy, wet, rainy snow, that may cut into some of the snowfall totals. Our temperatures right now are above freezing. So we're in the low 40s across the Piedmont Triad and we're in the 30s in the mountains. And later on this evening, we'll look for temps that are in the mid to upper upper 30s and we'll start to see a little bit of precipitation moving in but I think most of it will hold off until after midnight. The radar right now is dry across our region but you can see at least a little bit of Virga starting to push in some of that evaporating before it makes it to the ground and then you see all of that moisture. I want you to pay attention to this. There's one area of moisture here and then a secondary area back to the west. That's going to be important for snowfall totals and I'll talk about that in just a second. Here's what you can expect for tomorrow. Notice that the temperature do get above freezing, but just barely. That's why I do think in some spots it's not going to be just pure snow coming down. Same thing in the foothills, and because the wind might not likely be as strong in the foothill communities when we wedge in like this, temperatures may actually get a little bit higher in places like Mount Airy, even Yadkinville, and up toward Reedsville. So that may cut into the amount of snow that comes down too. I do think it's an all snow event in the mountains with temperatures staying at or just below freezing. Here's how it may play out. Notice there's going to be heavy precipitation. Some of this could be sleet down to the very far south and east of us. Most of what we're going to see though is either going to be snow with a little bit of rain mixed in. I'm not really anticipating any sleet or freezing rain across our area. That will happen a little farther to the southeast. But you can see tomorrow morning the snow is coming down. It continues for several hours. And then we actually get a little bonus batch of precipitation with that secondary area I showed you near the low. That happens around this time tomorrow evening. And then the storm is going to start to pull away and that will shut down the snow machine. Now for this storm, we do know that we're going to see rain and snow. We have confidence that is very low right now for the forecast amounts. We do think it's going to snow. That confidence is high. How much is really, really tricky with this storm system. You can see the blossom of areas that the models are putting out for significant snow across the region. And some of them saying that there will be a whole lot of snow in the area. But you can notice there that it's not uniform. Some areas getting less some areas getting more. It makes it very difficult for us to sort of fine tune where we're going to see that. It's because the farther north you are, you're on the edge of the moisture because of the track. Also with those temperatures, we were talking about that column of air needing to be frozen all the way to the ground throughout the event and that may not happen. So we are looking at snowfall totals that are going to be anywhere between one to three inches across the area and that means that there will likely be some elevated concerns for travel. One to three I think is good for the foothills and the triad. We will see some higher totals north and west in the mountains, some three to six inches and I do think there's room for a few spots in the triad that may see more than three. We're going to continue to talk Talk about this throughout this newscast, so stick around. Did Antifa supporters masquerade as Trump supporters in Wednesday's violent insurrection at the Capitol? Get the facts with the National Investigative Unit coming up.
You're watching WXII 12 News. We failed. We did not secure the Capitol. And people need to be held responsible and explain what went on. Failure to secure the Capitol leading to a deadly insurrection. Leaders in Washington, D.C. are now pushing for the president to be removed from office. The aftermath of the chaos on the Capitol yesterday. And within the last few minutes, we just learned the head of Capitol Police Union is now calling for the chief to resign, saying the riot showed, quote, failure of leadership at the very top. We'll talk much more about that in just a minute. But first, the triad and the foothills are preparing for some potential snowfall as early as just a few hours from now over to uh, this evening, overnight and into the morning hours. Chief Meteorologist Laney Pope tracking all of this for us. Laney, what is the timeline that you're thinking we're going to see here? Well, it looks like we could actually see a little bit of rain and snow developing late tonight. Not for the evening commute and probably not before midnight, but overnight into early tomorrow morning is when we anticipate having some of the snow coming down. And yes, it is likely going to cause some issues for you in the form of some travel concerns and yes, possibly some power outages. So you need to think about that. We've got a winter storm warning now for our area. Remember yesterday it was a watch. That warning is up for the entire triad as well as the mountains. Now winter storm warning means different things in different areas. Winter storm warning in the mountains means very significant snow, three to six plus. A winter storm warning across the triad is about one to three inches on average. And in any of that, of course, is going to be causing some problems, some slippery road conditions for the morning, evening commute, even into Saturday morning. And as I mentioned, the possibility for some power outages as well. Right now, all we have is clouds, but you notice that little area of blue that's just popping up. That is just some of what we call Virga, the initial moisture that is starting to push into the area. Some of that will evaporate. Eventually, though, we'll start to get at least some light sprinkles or some light uh, snow coming into the mountains. That'll be later on tonight. You see our storm system there with all of the moisture heading our way. Again, the heavy wet snow is likely going to hold off until tomorrow morning. It will continue for most of the day tomorrow and then wrap up tomorrow evening. We're anticipating some rain mixing in across the triad and foothills, but it should be mainly snow with mostly rain a little far to the south and east. The snowfall totals are the trickiest part of this forecast. I'm going to to talk about this particular storm and the challenges with it coming up. So stick around. Lenny, thank you. A lot of us are getting ready for that potential for our first round of snow this year and our first big snowstorm of the winter season. Big, of course, a relative term. WXI 12's Justin Schreier joins us live in Winston-Salem with a look at how people are preparing. Justin, what are you hearing tonight? And good evening. The DOT here at this road division covers about 5,000 miles and they also cover five counties. They take care of all the highways and state roads. John Ryan with the DOT tells me that crews have been out for much of the day laying down brine onto roadways. Now that brine is 23% salt water. Ryan says that the goal is to pre-treat the roads to hopefully break that bond between the pavement and any snow that may fall. He says crews will then be back early tomorrow morning ready to plow and lay down salt. He says if people venture out onto the roads tomorrow, they should be patient and make sure to give crews room to work. Slow down and give our operators a lot of room and a lot of grace. Big piece of equipment moving around in bad conditions. Um, uh, allow us to plow the snow out of the way and spread some salt. Ryan also tells me that they have about 400 people who are able to operate that snow removal equipment. Live in Winston-Salem tonight, Justin Schreier, the WXI 12 News. Justin, thank you very much. There is a growing claim on conservative websites that riots at the U.S. Capitol yesterday were actually instigated by Antifa, not supporters of the president. So is this true? Let's get the facts now with Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert in Washington. The National Investigative Unit got questions from some of you asking if Wednesday's insurrection could actually be a false flag operation. Perhaps adherents of the Antifa movement, you wondered, posed as Trump supporters. Some lawmakers have taken up that Antifa claim, citing what they've seen online. Some of the people who breached the Capitol today were not Trump supporters. They were masquerading as Trump supporters and in fact were members of the violent terrorist group Antifa. So let's get the facts. 
There is no evidence that all of these lawless rioters and insurrectionists, or even a significant number, draped in Trump hats, shirts, and flags, are part of a clever undercover Antifa operation. The D.C. Attorney General, who will prosecute arrests and charges, says it is Trump supporters who are trampling on the District of Columbia and have breached the U.S. Capitol. The media outlet Axios identified the familiar faces from the far right as part of the riots. And President Trump's hand-picked acting secretary of the Department of Homeland Security issued this blunt statement Thursday morning, condemning, quote, supporters of the president, using violence as a means to achieve political ends. This is unacceptable. Secretary Chad Wolf, a Republican, makes no mention of any Antifa activists. Not once. The FBI declined our request for comment, but it has launched a website for tips, photos, and information about the rioters and insurrectionists Wednesday. That website is fbi.gov slash U.S. Capitol. fbi.gov slash U.S. Capitol. In Washington, I'm Chief National Investigative Correspondent Mark Albert. One day after Governor Cooper extended his modified stay-at-home order, North Carolina health leaders have reported our highest single-day total for new infections. More than 10,000, almost 10,400 in fact, learned since just yesterday that they have tested positive for COVID-19. The first time that we have seen five digits in terms of new cases. Hospitalizations setting another new record. Almost 4,000 people are sick in a North Carolina hospital. Dr. Christopher Ohl said that while hospitals are quite busy here locally, people are, for now, still able to get what they need, and we certainly hope it stays that way. Hi, I'm Jeff Rawson. Coming up on Rawson Reports, the IRS just did it again. They're changing the rules about how you're supposed to get your second stimulus payment. But don't worry, we have the action you need to take right now to get that money fast. Next. Plus, a unique site in outer space where this massive Grand Canyon was recently discovered and how it compares to the one that we're quite a bit more familiar with in the United States. And as we had to break a look at how the stock market did today for the first time ever, the Dow finished above 31,000 and the NASDAQ finished above 13,000. Back in a moment, this is WXII 12 News at 5.
A Roman relic found at a home in England about 20 years ago is raising quite a few eyebrows tonight. The homeowner had no idea it was actually an ancient Roman marble slab. She was using it as a horse mounting block for about the last 10 years. Then one day she looked a little closer and noticed a laurel wreath carved into its face as well as a Greek inscription. An archaeologist dated it back to the second century with origins potentially in Greece. The stone is being sold right now at auction. That's happening next month. It's expected to fetch around 20 thousand dollars. Well, first it was murder hornets and now it's the dwarf snake. Scientists made the discovery of the Ware Swarf Swarf burrowing snake during some field missions. This species is native to islands in the Philippines. It has a low narrow skull relative to its size and the fewest number of vertebrae that any snake species in the world contains. All right. Because of our community, because someone loved us that doesn't even know us. Look at us. We're blessed. Responding to a viral plea for help here from a couple who is getting their prayers for a new kidney answered and in just the nick of time. Now to an all-new Rawson reports and a developing story that we're following right now. The IRS is changing the rules for how you get the new stimulus payment. And there's action that you might need to take right now in order to get your money. Our chief national consumer correspondent Jeff Rawson is here to explain everything that families need to know. Hey, we wanted to get right on the air with you because the IRS has just issued this urgent new alert about that second stimulus payment, the $600 payment that you're expecting. And this impacts millions of people. The IRS now saying, we sent this money out so fast just now that we made some mistakes. We sent the money to accounts that are closed. We sent the payments to places we shouldn't have. So a lot of you are logging into the irs.gov website and going into the get my payment tool right here, like they've been telling you to do, and you're getting this message. Payment number two status, 
not available. It's also impacting millions of you that use tax preparation services like H&R Block and TurboTax, who now say they're working with the IRS to fix the mistake and redeposit the money into your correct accounts in the coming days. But if you don't get your money in the coming days and weeks, it means it didn't work and you won't get your payment automatically. So the IRS is saying, here's what they want you to do. As soon as the 2020 tax season starts, and you're, you know, you're getting your taxes ready to, uh, to apply to the IRS, which is very soon, apply for the recovery rebate credit on your taxes, and that is the fastest way to get that second stimulus payment. Plus, they want you to file your taxes electronically this year with your updated bank account information. Even if you think they have it already, update it, file your taxes electronically. That'll be the fastest way to get the money. Again, the IRS saying they're bad. They sent the money out so fast. That's the reason this happened. But millions of you now have a way to get that money on your taxes. And we wanted to let you know. Back to you. Thank you, Jeff. Arizona's Grand Canyon may have met its match, even though it's on a different planet. NASA released this photo of a canyon on Mars, the largest canyon in our solar system to date. It stretches more than 2,500 miles across the Martian equator and is seven miles deep. According to NASA, if this was on Earth, the valley would span from New York City to San Francisco, California. That is big. So too our chances for snow tomorrow. Lenny Pope working from home, working hard, keeping an eye on our forecast, letting us know who's going to get rain, who's going to get slop and who's going to get pretty white flakes. I'll tell you what, it has been a very busy day coordinating with Michelle Kennedy, Brian Slocum, checking out the latest information and coming up with your forecast has been a challenge today for sure. I'm going to be honest, but I'm going to share with you what we think is going to happen over the next 24 hours. Take a look out there today where you probably notice sunshine early and then clouds kind of rolling in late today. And those clouds will bring us some wet weather and in the form of snow, it looks like for most areas, although I do think there's still the chance there's some rain kind of mixing in. So that's what makes our totals very tricky. Let's take a look at our temperatures, which are in the 40s across the area. We've got 42 in Greensboro, 42 in Winston-Salem. Right now, Lexington is at 40 degrees. As we travel up into the mountains, the temperatures are a little closer to freezing and life going to stay closer to freezing throughout this event and probably be below freezing in most of our mountains communities, which makes the mountain forecast a little bit easier with accumulating snow. A winter storm warning is out for the mountains, for the foothills, as well as the Piedmont Triad. But you notice the farther north you go, we're into this winter weather advisory zone and off to the east, and that's where we are anticipating less precipitation and for the column of air to be a little bit warmer and more rain to kind of mix in. So we are anticipating a heavy wet snow for some, but a little rain mixing in for others, especially south and east. Several inches of snow look to be a good get across our area, and as a result, there will likely be some impacts. So that snow rain area is right across the triad as well as the foothills. We're already starting to see some moistening of the atmosphere. I haven't gotten any reports of this making it down to the ground, but as we go through the evening hours, we'll look for that to happen. This evening, I do think there's a chance for a little bit of light rain or a light rain snow mix to kind of push into our area. That would be for the late evening, just before midnight, overnight and early tomorrow mornings when we really expect for it to be robust. And that's when we anticipate having some snow and rain as well as some snow pushing into our area with temperatures that will get down into the upper 20s in the mountains and low 30s across the triad. Our storm system is taking that track across southern Alabama and southern Georgia, which is really an ideal location provided the air is cold enough for us to get some snow across the region. You can see the winter storm warnings are right along the mountains and across the central part of North Carolina, as that's where we anticipate seeing most of the wintry weather. Now, as we look at this map here, you're going to notice the precipitation coming in. This is early tomorrow morning. I want you to pay attention to the fact that this is not all white, meaning this is not all snow. It is going to vary a great degree. Some communities are going to be cold enough for all snow. Some communities are not. And it is going to be very spotty, just like when it rains. Sometimes some folks get a half an inch. Sometimes some 
folks get closer to an inch. This is the scenario we're talking about, which makes it hard for us to blanket an area with snowfall amounts. By afternoon, though, I think there's going to be a secondary area that's going to develop, especially across the south and eastern parts of the triad, where the temperatures are cooling down because we're getting into the evening hours and that column of air cools again, and maybe we get a burst of additional snow across the eastern part of the triad. So that would lift those snowfall totals, and in some cases, it could push some triad communities over that three inch mark. So we'll watch for that for sure. Our triad forecast for tomorrow keeps the temperatures just above freezing. And I actually think some of our foothill communities may get a little bit warmer than the triad as the wind won't be quite as strong out of the northeast. The wind in the triad is going to be northeast at 10 to 20 miles an hour. That is a raw day and it keeps that column of air cold. For the mountains, we've got temperatures probably staying below freezing for most of this event. And that's why I do think we have the best chance of having more significant snowfall totals in those areas. You can see how we're sort of painting in early tomorrow morning and then going through the day tomorrow that area of snow that continues to push to the east watch how it even moves into places like Raleigh and Charlotte before eventually sort of dying out as it approaches the coast so again we're looking for some significant snow across our area we're going to be watching that column of air closely for you tonight and tomorrow as well as the track right now I do have a one to three inch area across that area is shaded in white. I think there's room for some higher totals, but I don't want to guarantee you that you're going to see three, four, five inches of snow when I also think there is an equal chance that we could have just an inch of snow in this area, depending on how much rain we end up with. So let's take a look at our forecast, the seven day forecast, and you will see the temperatures are plenty cold Saturday morning for some problems with travel. We're in the upper 20s. We do have some sunshine coming out over the weekend.
Back now with a final check on traffic before we hit the 6 o'clock hour. Here's what things look like right now. I-40 at Wendover Avenue in Greensboro. Plenty of volume in both directions, but westbound and eastbound not reporting any problems at this hour. We hope it stays that way. Well, next month, a couple desperate to find a kidney will get their prayers answered. One man threw a Hail Mary to try to get some help. His message ended up crossing state lines and it appears to have been successful. Now the love of his life is about to receive life saving surgery. Natalie Clark shares the story. One year ago, Aaron Thorne stood on a street corner in Hamilton, Ohio, wearing a sign that read need kidney for my wife. And we just tried it and within 30 minutes of being out there, um, here came the news media um, saying, hey, we want to be a part of this. And here we go. Aaron's efforts for his wife, Kelly, went viral. Between the Facebook page and the news media's help, it just went, it, it just exploded. A woman in Pittsburgh saw their story. After more than a dozen tests, Cheyenne Frappier learned she was a perfect match. And I was floored. It just brings back so many memories now. I was just, just, just amazed. I was just, wow. Like, and this all started by our community. The news came just in time. Kelly had to have both her kidneys removed in 2020 because of polycystic kidney disease. That led to internal bleeding and congestive heart failure. I go three days a week to dialysis um, for three and a half hours. <clears throat> when I'm done, I'm usually exhausted. Throw in a pandemic and Aaron's health, which includes surviving five strokes in 2019. And you can see why they call Cheyenne their hero. I was very excited, but at the same time, like, oh my gosh, someone is willing to give me a piece of themselves. The Thorns say this wouldn't be possible without the help of the community. Because of our community, because oh. someone loved us that doesn't even know us. Look at us, we're blessed. WXII 12 News at 6 starts right now. They should have been challenged. Warning shots should have been fired and lethal force should have been used. One day after a mob stormed the U.S. Capitol, questions about how and why this happened. Also, new calls for the president to be removed from office before the end of his term. At six, local lawmakers share what it was like to be inside the Capitol forced into lockdown when rioters vandalized federal grounds and stormed their way in. A local professor talks about comparisons being made between this chaotic scene and demonstrations calling for racial equality over the summer. Starting off tonight, though, a little bit closer to home. Winter weather is in our forecast. Some people, some emphasis on the <laughs> some could see significant snow. It's probably the little guys out there. <laughs> Chief Meteorologist Lainey Pope is mapping all of this out. So Lainey, what could we see and when does this start? I tell you what, that first snow of the winter season is exciting, right? And in the triad, I think there's a real good chance we'll have snow on the ground by this time tomorrow. We do have a winter storm warning that is out. Remember yesterday it was a watch. Now, one thing I'll caution you about, a winter storm warning means different things for different areas. In our mountain communities, winter storm warning means significant amounts of snow. A winter storm warning across the triad is one to three inches of snow. So you look at the map and you will see that winter storm warning is for David and Randolph, Guilford, Forsyth, and points north and west. The area that is shaded in purple, that's new since yesterday. That's a winter weather advisory, and that is for lesser amounts, but still an impactful winter event. We've got heavy, wet snow in the forecast for some, rain and snow kind of mixed for others, but we are anticipating several inches of snow. That will have impacts on travel as well as potentially some power outages. We've got clouds out there right now, some precipitation trying to move in. A lot of that is dry out before it makes it to the ground, but an indication that our atmosphere is moistening up. You will notice the storm a little farther south and west has tons of moisture, and yes, it's going to be moving into some cold air. You can already see the snow kind of blossoming there in southwestern North Carolina. Now, for this evening, I think we stay dry until the late evening hours, maybe 9, 10 o'clock. We might see a little bit of spit of light rain or maybe a little light snow as temperatures are above freezing for the most part. Then the rain and snow begins overnight 
tonight, a heavy wet snow in the forecast for tomorrow and snow showers even this time tomorrow night in the triad and then eventually wrapping up. I'm anticipating mostly snow in that white area on the screen, but some rain mixing in. Right now, I've got one to three inches of accumulating snow across much of our area. Higher amounts are possible. I'm going to be back with more, of course, and we're going to talk about what makes this storm particularly challenging in the snowfall amount department. Landy, thank you very much. Many school districts are making tomorrow a remote learning day. A lot of children are still learning remotely regardless. The list right now of all those impacted school systems are scrolling at the bottom of your screen. You can also find this information for free on the WXII 12 News mobile app. It's right inside our big weather story. You can also get the latest updates from our weather team on there as well. Tonight, calls for the president's removal from Democrats and people within his own administration admitted questions about how thousands of angry rioters took over and trashed the U.S. Capitol. Several lawmakers say this is a leadership and an intelligence failure and also a wake-up call. And now the head of the Capitol Police Union is calling on the chief to resign. At least 55 people are now facing charges in this Capitol riot, including a handful of folks from here in North Carolina. Crimes include unlawful entry, assault, and various weapons charges. Washington's acting U.S. attorney says one of the suspects had a military-style semi-automatic rifle and 11 Molotov cocktails. During a speech yesterday, the president encouraged supporters to march on the Capitol, saying, quote, you will never take back our country with weakness. His personal attorney, Rudy Giuliani, told supporters they should duke out their election election dispute another way with quote trial by combat. More than 100 members of Congress are calling for the president to be removed from office before his term expires. You've probably seen the side by side images on social media of yesterday's deadly riot compared to racial justice protests from over the summer. Many say there is a clear difference when it comes to use of force. Leanne Denyer spoke to a local advocate for civil rights and racial justice. Leanne. Well, there's been a lot of conversation about how what we saw yesterday compares to demonstrations we saw last year, and we took questions about that to Winston-Salem State University today. Dr. Jack Minnell of WSSU is an expert in social work, criminal justice, and human services. He weighed in by Zoom on what happened in D.C. What we've witnessed quite openly um, is that there's, there's a distinct difference in the justice system as it pertains to race, class, and gender. In the instances of yesterday's insurrection and violence at the Capitol, um, what you saw was an allowing of sorts, an apathetic response to people who literally and deliberately had planned and orchestrated to basically take over the Capitol. This wasn't a surprise. While not a surprise, he says, it's also not a pass for elected leaders at all levels. This was a culmination of the last four years. Every other day, every other week, there was some issue, some tweet, some post, some shooting, and it becomes emotionally daunting. Manel says he believes until big issues from criminal justice to education and health care access are addressed, the divide in this country will remain. He says he hopes there's accountability from everyone moving forward. Manel says he is angry, he is sad, but he's optimistic that there is something to be learned from what we saw in D.C. yesterday. In Winston-Salem, Leon Denier, WXII 12 News. Leanne, thank you. This evening, a seven-foot-tall fence is up around the U.S. Capitol building, and cleanup inside continues. Rioters trashed a number of offices. They broke windows, and while many watched a mob storm the U.S. Capitol on television, members of Congress experienced it firsthand. Bill O'Neill spoke with Representatives Ted Budd and Kathy Manning from the Piedmont about everything they experienced yesterday. Representatives Budd and Manning were both inside the House chamber when the Capitol was breached. Bud says that he was on the House floor. Manning says she was seated in the gallery above. We heard people pounding on the doors. Just three days after taking her oath of office, protesters forced Manning, a freshman Democrat from Greensboro, to flee the U.S. Capitol, but not before some harrowing moments. They, they told us that they needed us to get down on the floor and take cover. And so they had us all down on the floor, and then they told us, to remove our member pins so that no one could identify us if they got into the into the gallery. Did you ever fear that you were being threatened physically? 
the only time that I felt my heart rate go up was when we were on the floor and they told us to take off our member pins. And I thought about years ago when there were hijackings of airplanes and they, and I remember the Americans uh, being told to uh, shred their, to tear up their passports so that they wouldn't be able to identify the Americans. Did you feel that you were threatened? You know, it's definitely uh, a threat uh, when you can see that um, firearms were drawn and um, we were getting um, alert messages from the Capitol Police. Both Bud and Manning say they were ordered to grab gas masks before police evacuated them from the Capitol, taking them to a safe location. Bud says he worried about the safety not only of himself, but of staff members working inside the building. Did you actually see the protesters within the chamber itself while you were still there? No, just uh, we were we were feet away, but uh, by line of sight, we did not. The uh, the you know there was a, a lady that was unfortunately, as very tragic, um, uh, was killed. I would like to just get your sense as a, uh, a North Carolinian, uh, someone from the Piedmont Triad area, uh, share your thoughts on what happened there yesterday. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I think anyone with a mind and a heart just realizes what a tragedy it was. It was heartbreaking. Um, it, no one ever wants to see that. That was not representative of uh, how we do things in our country. Manning says lawmakers were kept isolated for hours, giving them plenty of time to talk about what happened. There were several people I heard in the room where they were holding us for so many hours, comparing it to 9-11. But there was a major difference. 9-11 was an attack on this country by foreign nationals. This was an attack on our country incited by our president that was done by Americans. Representatives Manning and Bud say despite the Capitol breach, everyone inside the building remained relatively calm, worked together, dealing with both the threat and making their escape. In Greensboro, I'm Bill O'Neill, WXII 12 News.